What's up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of the Lawyer You Know podcast. And I'm really excited about today's guest, but I will tell you, it was a bit of an audible. And this guy stepped up when I needed him to come on because I was planning to have him on after the verdict, which I thought would have been a really interesting point of view. Who's the person that, in my estimation, has been following this case the longest of anybody that I've seen. But I know you guys wanted a perspective of somebody who thought Richard Allen was guilty. And I have done my darndest to try to make it happen. I even recorded a podcast with somebody with that point of view, but they asked me to pull it for different reasons that they had. And I don't want to make anybody's life more difficult. So we were unable to post that this week. I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to get you guys that perspective at some point. Um, So hopefully I will be able to get that to you in the future. But don't worry, because this guy is a real criminal defense attorney. And I say that because there's all sorts of different people talking, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on YouTube, whatever it may be. Um, but but not everybody has tried a bunch of cases, argued with prosecutors, made plea deals, realized when their defendants are guilty, realized when they're fighting for an innocent person sitting next to them and how different that feels. And so all that to say that while we may agree on a lot of things in this case, I'm sure we'll find something to disagree with because that's usually what lawyers have to do. And I came across Defense Diaries Twitter years ago talking about the Richard Allen case. This was the case that kind of brought me to his Twitter page and he has been keeping things up to date and love him or hate him, usually it's because he is a real criminal defense lawyer. And that's where most of the feelings come that I see people talking about him on Twitter, talking way too much about the presumption of innocence, way too much about reasonable doubt, way too much about jurors being sure before you convict somebody of a heinous crime like this. So Bob, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you jumping in straight from the Bears game. It was a tough one. We don't have to talk about it. But thank you so much for being on, man. Seriously. It's my pleasure, Peter, man. I, I was excited that you you hit me up. I was literally, I, I had taken two of my kids and one of their, uh, my daughter's boyfriend uh, to the game today. And I was up in the colonnades and you hit me up. You're like, yo, uh, I know this is last minute, but can you hop on? I'm like, what time are you thinking? You're like, you're like, I got something going on with the family. Uh, I'll be back around six. I was like, dude, I'm in. So I've, I've been excited. I love your content, man. I think you do phenomenal work. Uh, it's like my wife and I were both attorneys, Allie. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were fans of you. We we love you. You know, you you just uh, you break you break stuff down in a way that's palatable for people that are not lawyers that can really digest it so we we have a deep respect for that because i try to do the same thing over on our youtube channel um and so i i uh, i realize how difficult it is you know to kind of to make it in a way that that we're trying to peel away some of the legalese so that it's it's easier for people that maybe haven't gone to law school and and haven't practiced law for them to understand so yeah man i'm happy to be here dude yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate it. I, I love it when I talk to lawyers and they say stuff like that to me because I'm like, wow, man, that that like it's like that's what I try to do. I don't yeah. always do it well, but I, I really appreciate it. That's you know, I, I that's flattering to me, I will just say. So I really appreciate you and your wife as well. Um, she's kind of hilarious on Twitter. Like I've seen some of her <laughs> stuff on Twitter too. And I, yeah. Um yeah. so I wanna everybody pretty much that knows you knows that you've kind of had a position from very early on in this case. And I want to start out for, with that. I want to jump right into it with that. And I want to ask you a pretty simple question. Do you believe, and I'm going to ask it to you in a way that's not really a legal question, but like, do you believe beyond a reasonable doubt, if you had to make a vote, is Richard Allen innocent? Not guilty or not guilty, not guilty or not guilty, but do you believe he is innocent? It's hard to know, you know, it's like, I can't, I would never presume to know because I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of the things I say on my, my lives all the time. And it's, you know, in a circumstantial case, it's impossible to know, you know, it's like, I I can give a best guess. Do I think that there's a world in which he could be? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do I think that there's a world in which he could have done it? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, like we're left in these types of cases having to try to figure out based on the evidence that's been collected by law enforcement. And once it's been vetted at trial to say, all right, well, do they have the evidence to convince me that he did this? You, you know what I mean? It's it's like when I kind of look at, at Richard Allen's background, he doesn't seem to fit. When I kind of look at the the story, 
in terms of where he was that day. And we'll get into this as we dig in, because I mean, there were, there were some holes from the defense side of that, which I, I'm certain that, that the jury has been battling with back in deliberations in terms of where was he after the fact. But when you look at the day leading up to it, you know, he's out at his parents' house. He didn't have work that day. You know, his sister came over. They were going to do lunch. He wasn't feeling it. Said he went home, you know, or, and bundled up and then went out to the trails, walked for a couple hours and then came home, you know. And then the problem with the case became that he gave two different time frames. So initially, he gave a time frame of that he was out at the bridge from 1 30 to 3 30 or sometime you know sometime like that he wasn't exactly sure so that was to dan doolin the resource officer when he gets pulled in five years later his time frame changes it goes from you know 12 to 1 30 and you know so that's problematic you know that's problematic anytime you have like a shift now can i see a world in which after five years dude didn't remember what he said and can't remember when he was out there yeah i mean if you're if you're being intellectually honest about it and you just think of it in like in terms of your own life you know it's 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 tough like i i if you're if you're gonna put my feet to the fire i think he's innocent i do i, I don't like it just it, it doesn't it doesn't it's never smelled right to me you know mm -hmm. it just hasn't so um you know but at the end of the day who cares what I think, you know, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? True. It's like, it's, well, it's like, it's, I it's, do care what you think because you've been there every day. You've been watching the evidence and you've been watching how it's all put out there. And what I love about that answer, it's, it makes me laugh because for anybody that doesn't know you, right. Uh, Bob's been in the firm, not guilty camp for basically the entirety of this case. And the trial hasn't changed your mind. At least I don't think it has, but we're going to get into a lot of those questions. But while he's in the not guilty camp, you just heard him explain because he can't help himself as a lawyer, what the issues are with that camp. And what the right. issues are with that side of the case. Because that's how lawyers look at cases, right? We we present our best evidence in the angles that work best for us and tell the story that, you know, we believe the evidence shows and points to, but we always know what the other side is thinking and what their strongest points are. And you've mentioned a few of them, and I, I want to talk about more of them today. That's really what I'm going to try to focus on. Um, even though I know there are a lot of issues in the, in the evidence for the prosecution, uh, I really want to focus on kind of looking at it the opposite way of how you've looked at it because you know so much about the case and you've thought about it and kind of compared both sides. And the question in court is not, do you believe he's innocent beyond a reasonable doubt, right? The question I just asked you is not a legal question. That's not what's before the jury. Before the jury is, is he guilty? Is he not guilty? Not right. guilty can be innocent. Some people on the jury may think he's innocent or not proven. Did they not prove the case? Right. Um, and, and knowing that that's kind of where you've been throughout this entire process, why don't you give us as brief of an overview as you can, because I know you could probably go on for days. What are the biggest issues that make you think the state didn't prove this case? And just so to clarify, I've never really been in the not guilty camp. I've been for two years very, very careful to be very clear that when they dropped the probable cause affidavit and it was sealed mm -hmm. for months, mm -hmm. and I, I was very curious, I'd piqued my interest, and, and I'm like, why are they sealing a PCA? I mean, you and I know. They are typically not sealed documents. Typically, that is what is put out to the public. As we all know, if you're an avid trial watcher or observer, I mean, that's that's the state's narrative getting out to the public, and that's what the public consumes typically. So I was very curious as to why this thing was, was being sealed. And then when it finally gets released to the public, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, wow, you know, it, to me, just as a defense attorney, I've, I've looked at thousands of probable cause affidavits you know i i just and to me i'm like you've got mere presence at the bridge you've got an unspent casing and you've got four eyewitnesses who are all describing somebody differently now i give eyewitnesses about as much weight as they deserve which is very little typically and that's no slight on the witnesses again it goes back to that concept if you don't know that you need to be committing something to memory at the time that you're seeing it your memory is only going to be as good as your mind allows it to be. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a different mm -hmm. thing where, you know, if you or I are walking out of a, a bar and we see that there's like an armed robbery going on across the street, we're trying to commit as many things to memory as humanly possible. You know, if they're, if they're jumping in a car, we're trying to get the make model. We're trying to see, Hey man, did you see the plate? You know, we're, we're doing all those things 
where you're just seeing somebody who's walking on a on a trail amongst many other people that you've seen walking on the trail that day i mean your your, your details are going to be sketchy For you know, sure. you're going to do the best that you can so you know like to me it boiled down to they had this unspent casing which they had a a forensic firearms examiner subjectively come to an opinion that it was it was a, a you know sufficient agreement with Richard Allen's gun which they had recovered in the search of his home and I'm like man there's just it's there's never been a case in the United States where that has been the key piece of evidence to convict somebody so you've got you've got him volunteering that he was out at the bridge and I and I just want to be clear it's like I've seen a lot of people misconstruing and misstating what was brought out in court he actually he went the day after the girls went missing uh he actually drove to the sheriff's station they they gave the information and then he didn't get called to the 18th of february so like he tried to go in right away and you know the, the state the way they portrayed it initially was hey you know what uh they called him and he said no uh i don't want you to come to my house uh no uh i can't come to the police station uh i'll meet you at a store and, and they portrayed it like that during their case in chief when it came out on cross-examination that the reality was is he was actually driving around in town and he was near this save a lot he's like like i'm right i'm out running errands like i'm right by the save a lot store i'm like if you can meet me here i'll meet you and i'll i'll tell you everything i know so he he meets dan doolin unfortunately dan doolin destroyed his notes and he didn't record the interview which is going to be a running theme in this particular case which has really been a problem for me um you know because at the end of the day when you kind of look at this and if richard allen is acquitted you know this this isn't like some kind of victory celebration this is this is awful because that means that that family those two families of those two little girls are going to be sitting there left wondering, wondering two things. One, did a guilty man just get off? Did the killer just get off? And two, and if not, is law enforcement going to continue to investigate to see who did this, despite the fact that they're seven years in? So, I mean, that's kind of where I've always been, you know, and that's not what, you know, like, like just putting aside the whole issue of the procedural process in this case, which was a nightmare. I mean, yeah. I, I've never seen anything like it, dude. Um, so like that, that was where I was at initially. I'm like, man, it, it leans innocent. That's where I've really been. I've never been not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. Now when Andrea got there and she sat through the trial, she's firmly in the not guilty camp. She's like, she's like, I think he's actually innocent, factually innocent. So like Andrea came out, like I was kind of waiting, I, like I was going to wait until after the jury came back and then kind of lay it out where I'm, where I'm at on it. But I mean, the reality is I, I don't know, man, you know, I wasn't there. It's disingenuous for me to say, I think, do I think that, that he probably didn't do it? Yeah. But I mean, there's, there's issues in it and I'm yeah. sure we're going to talk about it, you know? Yeah. Thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring this episode. The holiday season is just around the corner and we're all looking for ways to spend and stress less. HelloFresh makes mealtime nearly hassle-free with delicious, home-delivered, chef-crafted recipes that come together quick and are less expensive than takeout. Easily customized recipes so each meal is just the way you like it. There's always options available to trade or upgrade proteins or swap out side dishes. And we love to do this because we try to use HelloFresh for the whole family and everybody likes things a little bit different. The kids sometimes can be very picky, but it is so fresh, quick, easy, and delicious every time we work with HelloFresh in our kitchen. The kids love it. We can put it together as a family. It's easy to make, easy recipes to follow, and it just makes it really fun when the finished product actually does taste good as well. Uh, plus, you can check out HelloFresh Market for over 100 add-on items like desserts, quick bref breakfasts, snacks, and a lot more. This month, they even have Thanksgiving items to help wow a crowd with minimal effort on your part. So you're going to a Thanksgiving party or a Friendsgiving party, HelloFresh can help you bring something very cool that you can be honest when you say, I made this myself, right? I didn't just pull it out of the Tupperware and put it on the platter. So you can get 10 free meals at HelloFresh.com slash free L-Y-K applied across seven boxes. New subscribers only, and it varies by plan, but that's 10 
free HelloFresh meals. Just go to HelloFresh.com slash free L-Y-K. That's F-R-E-E-L-Y-K. So go to HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. And, and I think all we can really do, first off, to clarify where I'm at, like throughout the process, we should all be not guilty or presumed innocent, right? Until the state forces us into the guilty pile. Yeah. So saying that you're in the not guilty section throughout is not to say that you jump the gun on anything. That's where we should all be. We should all be skeptical. We should all wait. And it's only when the state proves it to us, should we really get into that other bucket? So from my perspective, the only way we, we can really call something like this with our opinion that doesn't really matter that much is how we would vote if we were sitting on the jury. Impossible for me. I've given where I would be based on what I've heard, but I'm not sitting in there. You're sitting in there. Right. It seems pretty clear to me for somebody like you, they haven't really gotten close to clearing the bar for where you need to get to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. And some of the issues that you mentioned are multiple eyewitness descriptions, some of which don't even come close to describing Richard Allen, um, the bullet, that single bullet. And one of the things to me, because I have talked to some people online in the chat, other people that I've kind of talked to that, that have been down there watching the entire trial, some of them have said things to me like, she's an expert. I just believe her. She seemed really smart. She said it. She did the testing and you know, yes, she needed that extra pressure with actually firing it. But once she did, she was able to confirm it matched Richard Allen's gun, which when I tell you that as a defense attorney makes you want to barf because that's why you want to keep stuff like that out. And that's right. what's so frustrating. It's like, that's why the lawyering and the decisions the judges make have such an effect on the trial because trial judges love to say, well, we'll see. It goes to the weight and we'll see. The jury will be able to credit or discredit that witness. It's like, judge, when we put up there and talk about how smart they are and how they've never been wrong, I've heard as a quote used in the trial about this witness. It's like at that point, if they don't really understand and it's all kind of confusing, they're like, well, the expert said it matched. Right. And, and that's why it's it's a really frustrating process. But, you know, you brought it up and, and I think to you, talk about that expert a little bit. We talked about it a little before, but it yeah. was not very convincing to you, right? No. You, it, you kind of understand how this works. That's a problem. Yeah. And leading into trial, you know, on on over on our channel, I'm like, look, in Indiana, because there's a couple of things, and I'm sure you've talked about Fry and Daubert prior mm -hmm. to, it, they don't really follow either there. It, it really, their their kind of viewpoint is we're going to let it in and go to exactly what you were talking about. It's not an admiss admissibility issue. It's a, an issue of weight. You can give whatever weight that you deem appropriate. And so when she comes on, and we're talking about Melissa Oberg, their forensic firearms examiner, she testifies, and I'm sitting there expecting the presentation at least where she's going to show her work for, for lack of a better term. And, th and that was kind of how the defense's expert put it. It's like, you have to show your work. So she, she comes in, she best, she basically testifies. They show very briefly like four of her microscopic side by sides or, you know, she's got a comparison microscope. She threw a few images up there. You see one that has some gross marks, which are the, the more prominent marks, which are really, without getting too like nerdy about it, those are like subclass. Now subclass in terms of this type of analysis it is only used to clear the field of other weapons, meaning that it can't be used to be the identifier where she can go in and say, all right, that that is absolutely, I, I'm saying there's sufficient agreement here. You've got to use the fine marks, like the individualized characteristics that's what you need to be able to show and so like it didn't happen i'm like like she got up there she gave her testimony and and i'm not i'm not even I'm like in no way shape or form of i trying to like overblow this she she basically just said to the jury trust me like I, i'm an expert it's right i verified it with my my boss my supervisor he came in you know it was it wasn't necessarily blind it was kind of blind in terms of he didn't know what my what my end analysis was he came in and, and he did his own analysis and then we both came up with it being you know sufficient agreement so i'm like wow um that's scary because the reality is and, and you and i both know this is that that kind of evidence to a jury of lay people is powerful you know, for exactly the reasons you said, you know, you've got a, you've got a, a lab tech in there who's not a cop, but you know, she's been doing it for a long time. 
She's throwing around, you know, error rates that are very low, you know, and, and then the defense is in there trying to cross it with legitimate cross-examination questions. Well, if you're being honest, there's never been any studies done on an unspent casing comparison have there. There's nothing out there that you can rely on. She's like, well, yeah, that's true. So in terms of the error rate being something that you can really, where it's very low, like in terms of it being like 2%, 2.7% error rate on a, on a fired round, you know, that that's pretty compelling to a jury. So, you know, going into it, that that is going to be a compelling piece of evidence for any jury. The question then becomes how compelling is the defense's witness going to become? when he testifies and you know is he going to be able to combat that you know they had the disadvantage of their expert not actually doing the testing himself he didn't say hey i want to come in i want to see if i can recreate it and remember like the bigger thing which you touched upon peter is the fact that she could not reproduce the same marks with the theory of what they're claiming happened which was that the round was ejected when he racked the weapon which would have had to have been a second time if you know anything about firearms it's basically first time you rack a weapon and you have your magazine in there you've got the the extractor pulling the the round out of the magazine putting it in the chamber if you then say you don't use your gun you want to keep one in the chamber at all times a lot of gun owners do that you know but say that you're getting home you're gonna you're gonna make your weapon safe for the house if you got kids or just in general if you're a safe gun gun owner you know you're gonna want to un unload it you're gonna want to get it cleaned out so you'll rack it again and that'll eject eject the round so that's what they're saying happened so they mm -hmm. essentially the state's theory became that he racks it up on the bridge okay and, and they're definitive Tony Liggett, who was the, the sheriff, he's now the sheriff, he was of the mindset that when he listened to the, the, the video, you know, hundreds of times with headphones on that he hears the gun being racked. Now, I couldn't hear anything even remotely close to that. It sounded like, you know, the large gravel type rocks crunching under her feet. I didn't hear any gun rack, but I didn't have headphones on either. So maybe he hears it. But what that means is that's the first time it's pulling the round up into the, the chamber from the magazine. So then the state's theory then becomes that down at the crime scene that he racked it again, you know, probably with the concept that he's trying to maintain force and control over the girls. Cause you're talking about one, one man trying to corral two girls while he's either assaulting or killing the other one because we have a situation where there's no ligature marks they were not bound it's like it's a problem for the state like how is one dude controlling two very athletic girls if they're not if one of them's not bound you, you know unless unless it's it could like why isn't one of them running while he's doing awful things to the other one you, you know and it's like why aren't they screaming well, any like, of that it, like any of that Right. None of that happens, you know, and, and it's like, and I've been out to the bridge. I've gone out there multiple times and I, 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 it sound carries. There's no other way to put it. Like when I was on the bridge, I think probably about, I'd say 15 yards uh, to the north of me, I'd call it the Northwest. There was like kind of a ridge, like a large kind of craggy ridge. And, you know, at this point it's fall. This was a, this was like a week ago, the leaves had started to fall and I heard like a critter. And it sounded very, very distinct to me. It was loud. I thought it was a deer and I kept looking over there and I never saw anything. And I, I come to realize the second time I went out to the bridge that there were two squirrels that were bounding around like 15 feet away from me. And it was just, it was so distinct. I mean, the sound really carries and, and we're not talking about a great distance from, you know, being on the bridge to where the crime scene itself was. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's hard to, to digest the fact that number one, they didn't really establish a time of death. Their time of death is like Murdoch style, except not nearly as compelling. You know, it's like when they built that, it, they built that timeline in terms of the time of death when with Paul and Maggie's phone and Murdoch, it blew my mind. That was like the first time I had ever really in my memory come across where a prosecutor was really able to to build a pretty comprehensive time of death 
based on phone usage or lack thereof, based on historical usage of Paul's phone. You know what I mean? It was like, mm -hmm. and this isn't that. Like they they've got it where it's like the phone stopped moving according to her uh, Libby's Apple Health data, and that's it. You know, so yeah, the, the like the the round thing, man, scares me. You know, in terms of being a defense attorney and just the weight that they're going to give it, and and I. We don't have, I don't, do you guys have jury questions down in Florida? Yeah. See, we, we do not in Illinois, like we do not get jury questions. Not so. every judge, um, encourages it, but, but yes. Like in, in Lee lawyer Lee, who I know you had on, you, you know, mm -hmm. we had a really interesting conversation about that where I, I kind of initially, I liked the concept. I liked the concept. And then Lee kind of opened my mind to a different perspective of it where she's like, well, you know, the problem is if they're coming in with a, a preconceived notion, which they're not supposed to, but we know it's not reality. We're all human beings. People have opinions. If they've got, you know, a P, if, if they don't have a, a, like a, an opinion coming in when they're hearing the state's case in chief first, they start forming opinions, right? And she was concerned that these questions and the ability for them to be able to kind of discuss and pre-deliberate prior to the deliberation after all the evidence is closed she's like i worry about that because i think that that really allows them to like ingrain things that might be confirmation bias in their head based on the fact that they've only heard the state's case and that can be problematic to the defendant which when i thought about it i'm like man yeah that's true like that, well, that definitely could be an issue in Florida, they're not allowed to talk or deliberate about the case at all. Either they're just, they're, they're allowed to ask questions. I like jury questions personally. Sometimes it, it goes bad for you, right? And you can realize right. issues, but I want to know what they're thinking. I want to know what questions they're having. Like, and a lot of what I do is civil now. Yeah. Um, and it's it's very different. It's, it's, sometimes it seems very similar to criminal defense because they try to make our client into a criminal. Right. Um, but we're prosecuting the case, right? We're on the offensive. We usually win. And usually jury questions can be good for us or help us. So that, that may be some of that coming in. But I personally like, I mean, it's just like when these jurors come out and do interviews. Some people don't like it. Some people get annoyed at it. I'm like, they're having thoughts, whether they say them or not. So why not let us hear them? Like, why I not love, let I love. be out there? Yeah. Right? You know how it is, man. It's like, I, like anytime a case is done, win, lose, doesn't matter. I always want to talk to them. Absolutely. If we lost, I want to know, I'm like, what turned it for you? I'm like, did you detest me? <laughs> yeah. It's like all the different things that you want to know. Like, I always want to talk to them. So to kind of go back to the point. So when they asked the jury question, there were two questions after the defense's forensic uh, firearm guy testified. And it became evident to me that at least one of those jurors had given a lot of weight to Oberg, you know? So I knew right there that there was an issue for the defense because of the two questions asked, which were one, were you aware that Oberg's work was verified? Right. And so like you knew that right there. So you know that, that there's at least one juror mm -hmm. that finds that to be legitimate, you know, and, and whether or not that's, that's going to hold up when they get back into look right. I mean, can't blame them. right. You can't, you know, so yeah, I, I kind of, I ended up, kind of being like neutral on the questions. I, I like, I like it. I like, like, I like the concept of being able to kind of get into their mind a little bit mm -hmm. and see where they're at as the trial progresses. So, um, but it, it can scare you if you're a defense attorney, when you're sitting here, here, like I would always be looking cause the way that they would do it, all the, the, so the judge would always address the jury should say, okay, do you guys have any questions? And then they'd write them down. They'd hand them to the bailiff bailiff, bailiff would bring them up to the judge. Judge would say, okay, counsel would, Let's go back into the corner, throw on the white noise. They'd discuss mm -hmm. it. If it was compliant with the law and they felt that it was something they could answer or that it was something that was askable without violating any of the rules of evidence, she'd come back on the bench and then she'd read them. And then after the witness would answer, then the state would have an opportunity to ask follow-up questions. And then after that, the defense would have an opportunity to, to ask follow-up questions. So I, I thought it was really interesting and I, and I did kind of like it, but I would always be observing both sides when they're walking back. Now I was closest to defense counsel table because I was on the defense side of it over in the gallery. So I would see eye rolls or, you know, it's like you could kind of get a vibe of like from the questions 
or eyebrows being raised, mm -hmm. you know, how they were feeling about it. So it was really interesting. And, and for me, I kind of like that, that aspect of it, but Lee's point was well taken, you know, with respect to kind of like, I can see that being an issue in terms of ingraining things uh, with the jury questions, it, but especially with this pre-deliberation thing. And it's, it's limited. It's not, it, it's only like during breaks. So when like if there's together. a reset, right. When they're all together, they can't go back at the hotel. And if they have a common area, they all chill at or whatever. Yeah. They're not hanging around talking about the case. So it's, yeah. it's limited, but still it's typically after a witness and you still, you're going to have like during one of the, one of the cases in chief, they're going to be going back. They're going to be talking about it. And I, I can see Lee's point that that part of it, I, I don't like that part of it. I, I think that yeah. they should be left to deliberate at the end unequivocally. And I think we've, we've kind of hammered to death this ballistics expert, but just, it's interesting to know. I did not know that they had, that they didn't necessarily use Daubert or Fry because having something that has to be peer reviewed and published and <clears throat> has to have testable technique that you should be able to recreate. Right. Put the defense in like an impossible situation because their expert wouldn't even be able to recreate it because it's not recreatable, which right. the state's expert testified to, which as a lawyer, you're like, boom, I won, you know, I can't recreate right. it. My guy can't test it. But then the jury's sitting there like, well, she put it under a microscope. And if you put <laughs> right. it under a microscope as an expert and you see the lines, well then, right. then that's the stuff that sucks because the jury's not going to see that the same way as a lawyer, um, which is why we are limited sometimes in knowing what a jury is going to do with stuff. Cause as I'm sure has happened to you sometimes after my case, they're like, yeah, you won because of this. And I was like, I didn't, right. we didn't even prepare for our expert to say that, but our expert said something and they're like, and I know because I, I've been to the, my uncle's been to the hospital with this same issue. And I know what that means. And we were like, okay, you know, wow. you never, really yeah. know what stick you, to. you never do. You never do. Cause it's like the fact that their expert, even when they had Oberg on cross, and they brought out that fact that she could not recreate, you know, the same marks by doing just racking the gun and ejecting it. She couldn't make them. They weren't sufficient enough. She couldn't even, she couldn't even test them to, to really make any kind of comparison. So she had to fire the rounds. The, the, you know, the round that she made the sufficient agreement finding on was essentially a fired round, you know, which right. obviously you've got it's the pin. Different. Right. It's completely different. Like the pressure that builds from the casing in order to expel the, you know, the bullet or the projectile is massive, you know, it's, it's a much harder thing. So, you know, but like you said, man, we're lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> you and I think I'm like, that's ridiculous. But the yeah. jury, you know, I mean, they didn't think that's at least one of them supposed to be the gatekeeper. Of, right. I right. mean, that, that's one of the frustrating parts is, really you know, that that's something that we wouldn't necessarily call harmless error if they find out she made the wrong call on that. Right. Um, you mentioned that you've been sitting on the defense side yeah, and something I've heard, about Bob Mata is he is in, he's on the defense team. He is sitting with Richard Allen's wife. Um, he is as in the bag as you can be. Okay. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Um, which if you're on the defense team, great, more power to you. Everybody deserves a defense. If you want to help them. Great. No, I, I have no beef with that. Do you think, is there any truth to that? Have you been working with them? Are you sitting with Richard Allen's wife? Do you feel like you are, enthralled in this as if it's a friend or family member for you what is kind of your vibe with the trial personally yeah no uh not part of the defense team <laughs> at all uh i'm certainly friendly with kara winicky and michael osbrick who were two of the attorneys that handled the uh, original action uh, i've certainly spoken with both brad and andy i mean we're defense bar guys so you know from that perspective I'm not licensed in Indiana. I, I can't practice in Indiana. Um, I've never seen the discovery. So anything that, that would have been coming from, from me to anybody on the defense side would have been just, Hey, keep your head up. You know, this is a, sure. this is a brutal case because Allison and I frankly tried a case in Omaha that was very, very similar procedurally. You know, it was a case that she got removed from, you know, we had, we had a judge that was kind of like, you know, running hot at us because we were aggressive. We were in a, uh, we were pro hoc, which means that we weren't licensed in Nebraska. So we were there admitted on a limited license. So we went, and it was a death penalty case. So we went in scorched earth, you know, and I warned everybody that we were going to come in because, you know, when you're playing in your home turf, you're trying to maintain relationships. You have, you have other clients, 
you can't go in there just like a bull in a china shop you have to maintain especially in the criminal area where you've got you know clients that are in that courtroom with trials pending you know you've got to try to maintain relationships that are at least workable with the prosecutor's office you don't want to be pissing the judge off all the time you know those are the kinds of things that you're you're cognizant of you have a lot more free reign to to be able to kind of go as aggressive as you want to be if you're not in your jurisdiction and you have no intent on ever practicing there again you can definitely go harder and, and on a death penalty case Allison and I are going to do everything in our power to, to make sure that they are proving that case beyond a reasonable doubt because the end game is they're, they're executing our client, you know? So like, I, I want to be able to look at myself in the mirror and, and like live with that because that's a heavy weight, you know, people that don't kind of practice law and don't understand the fact that, you know, you're representing people and it's their liberty and, or their lives at stake. It's, it's a very, very heavy weight that's taken very, very seriously by, you know, litigators that, that really care, you know, and Alice and I are definitely that. So as far as me working with the defense team, that's murder sheet coming out with that. They were, you know, they're like, Oh, Mott is a shill for the, for the defense. I'm like, nah, I'm a shill for due process and I'm a shill for the constitutional rights of every citizen. That's, you know, and it's like my entire two, two years of podcast only. And then when I started the YouTube channel, has only been reading the documents only i've never discussed the evidence because i don't know the evidence well now i do at least i know because what they introduced at trial you know so but i was making headway with people just in terms of that concept of innocent until proven guilty mm -hmm. and that we have rights known as due process and every defendant no matter what they're accused of doing has a right to a fair trial and that was all being in my estimation flame thrown through this entire thing when she removed his two lawyers that was to me the point where i like i i was like i've got to speak up as a defense attorney as a defense bar guy and it wasn't just me i just happened to have the loudest voice you know i mean you had indiana attorneys like throwing their hat in the ring pro bono saying i'm gonna write the the writ of mandamus to get this in front of the supreme court because what's happening here is insane mm -hmm. you know and and that happened and they got it up you know, because when that all came out, when, and if you haven't followed the cases as deeply, and I'm talking to, to our audience here, you know, like they were removed at one point after there, were, there was a leak, you know, and the leak, and I kept trying to explain to people, and, and, and like, I don't know how you guys keep your office, like whenever we have like a large case, we always have a war room is what we would call it, you know, and, and I never necessarily locked down my war room. Obviously we'd have, you know, the discovery laying all over the place. We'd had cork boards, everything, you know, I mean, we're, we're preparing for the case in there. And at, at some point, uh, a friend of Baldwin's came in and just completely breached their friendship and trust and like took snapshots of pictures unwittingly to, to Baldwin and, you know, then went, went out and dispersed them. So that became a big thing in this case. And, you know, fortunately they never really leaked massively. There was, you know, people took a lot of exception. I kept calling it a drip <laughs> because they didn't, it wasn't a massive leak. They weren't out on the internet for the entire world to see. And I kept trying to explain to people, I'm like defense attorneys in a case like this, the last thing in the world they want is images of two beautiful young girls that have been brutally slayed out in the public when their client is the one sitting in prison awaiting mm -hmm. trial because all that that does is incite anger. <laughs> And and it just makes the people out that are potential jurors out in the public have like a, like a true bias for them already because it's like you're looking at the like it's just not something they're, a defense they become attorney would ever do. Nails. They become yeah, hammers and, for nails for justice right. even more, and then everything starts to look like a nail when when they really get you know, their passions get inflamed with things like that. It doesn't help defense. Thank you to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this episode. It's really important to understand that going online without ExpressVPN is like leaving your laptop unattended at a coffee shop while you run to the bathroom real quick. Most of the time you're probably fine, but what if one day you come out of the bathroom and your laptop is gone? ExpressVPN stops hackers from stealing your data by creating a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet. It's super secure. It would take a hacker with a supercomputer in over a billion years to get past ExpressVPN's encryption. It's easy to use, 
and it works on all devices. It's also been rated number one by top tech reviewers like CNET and The Verge. I know what it's like to get your information hacked or have people try to do that, and it sucks. Having this layer of protection from ExpressVPN gives me a lot more peace in a tech world that I know is getting more and more out of my control. So right now you can take advantage of ExpressVPN's Black Friday slash Cyber Monday offer to get the absolute best VPN deal you'll find all year. Use my special link, expressvpn.com slash LYK to get four extra months with the 12 month plan or six extra months with the 24 month plan totally free. That's expressvpn.com slash LYK to get an extra four months or even six months of Ex ExpressVPN for free. It doesn't, it never does. And, and so ultimately, uh, I'm actually sitting with Kathy Allen at her. She invited me to sit with her. She appreciated my it's coverage. For the wife, right. For anybody that does. Okay. Yes. That, that's Kathy is Rick, Rick's wife. Um, you know, she just appreciated my, you know, kind of my content for the last two years. Cause I was kind of the only person out here taking a beating, just saying, can we wait? Can we just wait till trial? Can we just, can we please wait? Cause you know, I mean the five years leading up and if you don't know anything about the case out there, you know, it was seven, it was five years before anybody was arrested on this thing. So as you can imagine in the web sleuth world and the Reddit world, you know, anywhere in the Facebook groups, like people were trying to sleuth this thing to death. You know, that's where you got the Kagan Kleins and the, and the Ron Logans and all the other people that people were thinking were the, the perpetrators on this. Everybody was trying to solve the case. Everybody had opinions on it. Like, in, and I didn't get involved with it and I knew about that, but that's not my game. Like I'm a, I'm a pleadings reader. You know, I like to try to explain the law to people. That's what our channel is about. So like when they made the arrest, that's when I got involved and I, and I, I, like I, I, I stuck my neck out, you, you know, it's like, it's like you're, you know how it is when you're starting a channel, it's way easier to just be neutral guy. You know, it's like to not, to not get into any of that. And when I, I saw what was going on here, I felt compelled as a defense attorney to, to, you know, really use my platform to try to explain to people what defense attorneys really do, that we're not like these bottom feeder scumbags trying to get criminals off left and right on loopholes. I'm like, what we're really doing is defending the principles of the Constitution. I mean, like, if, but for defense attorneys, who else does it? Like people, I think, tend to forget that that document was written in order to let the government know. This is what you cannot do. You cannot make laws that infringe upon these rights of us, the citizens. And it's only defense attorneys when we, when I'm drafting a motion to suppress, it, like, don't point your finger at me and call me the bad guy if a cop has violated somebody's Fourth Amendment rights in a bad search. And I filed that motion to suppress the evidence because it was a bad search. You point your finger at the cop and tell him to do better. You know, I mean, the teeth in that thing is that if they suppress the evidence and the case gets dropped, that's not on the lawyer. That's on the cop who violated the, you know, the constitutional rights of the defendant. And if we don't do that, I mean, what do you think happens? Right. I mean, if we're not filing those motions, it's a free for all. Defense attorneys defend everybody. That's what people don't yeah. understand is. Right. It's, it's the one person that any of us can look at in our house in our chair and be like, oh, it's disgusting that they did that as soon as we hear that a cop arrests them. And in reality, if you were in that position, if a loved one was in that position, you would look at it very differently. I know it's hard for people to put themselves in that spot, but that's just how it is. And we know because we've had lots of clients and we see what it's actually like and how people's lives can be affected. Even people that are guilty and commit crimes, making the right kind of deal for that person can change their lives. Yeah. Um, and it can be really important and it should be a part of the process, right? Rehabilitation, hoping for that, trying to set up a system for that should be part of that process, which kind of leads me into prison versus jail. Big question in this case, because we have some confessions, right? And I think I've been pretty adamant from everything that I have heard, which again is all coming secondhand, the bullet, the eyewitnesses, the timeline, the phone stuff the, you know, covering them up with sticks, even taking Odin and third party culprit stuff out. There's just no way that that gets anywhere near proving this case beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. Um, and if that's all they had, man, would it be tough to go to trial on this case with a straight face if I was the prosecutor, but they have the confessions, right? And maybe they knew that right with what happened over the months and months, uh, post arrest pre-confession. 
but they do have confessions. And as a criminal defense attorney, 20 plus years, like you said, I assume you've worked on some cases. Were you a prosecutor before or defense attorney straight? Straight. straight okay. Straight D guy. So I, I assume that, pause, I, I assume that you've had some cases that have dealt with confessions. Okay. How, have you had cases that have dealt with confessions that you have argued or your client told you later were false confessions? Yes. Okay. What percentage would you guess? Just top of your head. Pretty low. Pretty right. low. I mean, Less mo than most- 10%. Yeah, like way less. I'd say, okay. you know, in the th one to three percent range. I mean, defendants typically aren't saying I I did it, you know. Right. And and if they if they do, if they did talk, it's typically not a false confession. Right. It's, it's like they didn't they didn't follow my advice, and you know, if they were a repeat customer, you know, and no matter how many times I'm like, dude, you don't open your mouth, man. It's a simple rule, dude. I've got right. one rule, and you know, it's like, but when you get in the pressure of that situation. You know, when the cops do what they do, you know, they talk, you know, most of the time. So yeah, false confessions, super rare. Super well, you're, rare. So you're seeing where I'm going, right? But so 100%. false confessions is, you know, a very small percentage. And then actually proving that that confession is false. It's less than 1%. It's got to be less yep. than 1%. Yep. Now you have a confession, you say it's a false confession, then you actually prove to the jury that it's a false confession. So incredibly, incredibly rare situation. But I assume that because of where you're at at the end of the case, not feeling like the state has, has proven him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, that, that you believe this is, or these confessions are false. Is that where you're at? Yeah, well, yeah. And, and like, Coerced, obviously, the, well, you say, mental break. It was more than that. It was more than that because it was like, so I was at both, like every safekeeping hearing. So safekeeping is, is kind of a, a process that, you know, the prosecution will go or law enforcement will say, hey, we're worried that this defendant's not going to make it. So in this particular case, Richard Allen was deemed what they call a safekeeper before he even had an attorney. So like I, I had a problem with that initially when I heard about it because he wasn't even present when they they had this and it's a substantive ruling, right? I mean, it, like that is it's one of those due process things that I'm always talking about that Allen absolutely had. That he was in that position before. Right. So he gets put into safekeeping almost immediately based on nothing, no real threat, no actual threat. So when Rosie and Baldwin filed the first motion to vacate that safekeeping hearing because they wanted him out of prison because the end result of that safekeeping, once the, once that that was granted and that motion was filed and granted, they moved him directly to Westville, which is the house of pain. It's like the, it's the worst of the worst where the worst of the worst go in indiana and he was in the most secure cell in the most secure prison in the state of indiana and he's a pretrial detainee so and if people don't know pretrial detainee is obviously somebody who's just been arrested and they're awaiting trial and they are typically kept in the county jail like if they cannot bond out they are typically kept and held in a county jail so it's very unusual to have somebody kept in a prison you know, to, to like a, every witness was like, yeah, this was, this was the only time I had seen that. So when, when Rosie and Rosie was really the one that was handling kind of the confession side of it, like in terms of trying to get him out. So when they filed the first one in June, when we went in for that hearing, that was the first that we had ever heard in open court when McClellan brought up the fact that, that Rick Allen had been confessing, that he had written a letter and we're all like, oh my God, what? Like we heard of it and then it didn't get litigated in that hearing. We never, it was like, he brought up confessions. The judge basically recessed it. We came back and then you didn't hear about the confessions for the rest of the day, but it was out there. It was like, he's confessed. So in that particular motion, like Rosie was really trying to get into the confinement conditions that were going on. This was not your normal confinement conditions. So leading into it. So that was always my X factor in this case. I'm like, I have to hear the confessions like to like I need to, to hear them and I need to see what he has written before I can come to any kind of conclusion, whether they're they're legit or not, you know, based on my experience. And so when we get in there and, and Peter, I've never seen a case where they have allowed this much what I would consider to be collateral evidence in terms of the conditions of his confinement than I had in this case. I've never seen anything like it. Like, so the, like that's one thing that she allowed in. I mean, they played, 
about two hours of his because his incel uh videos where they had him being like monitored with video without sound 24 7. so if he was in his cell there was always a camera running which is not usual it's mm -hmm. not that's not how it goes in prison um and then whenever he was transported they were following him with a camcorder which had audio and video and so anywhere they moved him he was 24 7 under surveillance and so they show all this to the jury and and rosie had actually asked to have the for for whatever dignity alan might have left they they turned the screen away from the gallery so we couldn't see the actual videos of him in cell that's where he's eating his own feces and smashing his head into the cinder blocks and and this goes on for a period of about four months so he's in there five months from november and then the confessions start in april all right so that like he's been he's in there a solid five months he comes in with major depressive disorder and these are both diagnosed and anxiety which far predate the 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 crime all right so this isn't like something that developed after you know if that's a theory that people have he, he had this since childhood the depression and the anxiety he was always a very anxious person you know it's been put out there that he's got um he's got this issue where he's got this dependency disorder you know that he he constantly needs he needs people kind of building him up all the time because he always feels worthless and he's he's very passive he's a very like westcott who was the defense's expert i thought was was very good in terms of explaining just who he was coming into this you know into this case mentally like where his mental health was and i, I thought she was very compelling and, and i think that that it went a long way in terms of kind of mitigating these things now the big issue is going to be there's one particular and it's not it's not him calling his wife or his mother because we heard about nine of those we heard nine different calls that they presented into evidence and moved into evidence during the trial most of them were to kathy most of them were very generic you know just kind of standard i did it i did it and then he'd backtrack within every call you know he was he was aside from the one with jan which was the last one he was basically saying i'm I, i'm losing my mind it's like i can't kill like i don't so they had deemed him psychotic so he was deemed psychotic in april and they started giving him the halidol uh in late april and then they gave him uh, another shot every 30 days so he got one in may and then june so he's definitely psychotic now there was a lot of talk about feigning which i typically call malingering uh, but they call it feigning or faking and you know walla monica walla who was his prison psychologist was the one who kind of brought this issue up as to whether or not she thought he was feigning to me that was such a circular argument in terms of like like make it make sense to me so wait he's confessing but then he's eating his own feces in order to That's try to say that his confession was not legitimate because he's crazy i'm like it's it's like, like there, there's there's no way to make that argument work in my mind and i tried i'm like all right what are, what are they what are they getting at like these are happening contemporaneously and if he's faking why are you medicating him exactly and in the the point being is that when you were medicating somebody for psychosis that means that they're psychotic so it's like you're you're not you're not curing them instantaneously it's going to be a process and so every injection that they gave him every 30 days it's because he was psychotic i think that that the defense's expert westcott did a did a pretty good job with with allowing the jury to understand exactly who he was mental health wise coming into the case you know what i mean that this was pre-existing long long prior to the crimes like i said so the, the problem is going to be the the written statement that walla monica walla printed out like based on notes that she was taking from this one discussion that she had with him wherein he gave details so this is where the van comes up we've all heard about the van it's where his, he, she basically writes it in a narrative form with a beginning a middle and an end which westcott says like if you look at doctor's soap notes that's not how like psychologists or 
You know, that's not how they keep their notes. Like typically it's you're jotting down things that they're saying. You're not writing narratives like that. And she turned it into like a narrative story form type of confession. So, and it basically goes like this. It's, it's like, you know, I was at my parents that morning. My sister came over. They wanted to go do lunch. I didn't want to do that. I went out. I bought a six pack of beer. I drank three early. I didn't drink the rest you know, until a little bit later, went home, uh, decided it was a pretty nice day out. I'm going to go out to the bridge. I got bundled up. I got out to the bridge. Um, he doesn't like never talks about like developing the plan to go kill two girls. though. like that, like that's the flaw kind of in this whole thing. Like, you know, like there's no, there's no build up to it. It's like, I do, I drink the beer, I get bundled up, I go out to the trails, and then I start looking for two girls. He says, I'm lying in wait. And that's in quotes. So um, I'm lying in wait. Term. Yeah, you know, I'm lying in wait. And then uh, I see I see the girls. Uh, I start following them. At some point, uh, I do so and this is another quote, I do something with the gun. And uh, that's that's what happened with the bullet. <laughs> Like, that's how he describes it. Like, and it, it sounds like it's up on the bridge. All right. He says, I then tell them uh, to go down the hill. My intent was to assault them. And when I was heading down, I saw a van, not a white van, just a van. It scared me. I had them cross the river. And then I cut their throats. I kept out of sight when I left the trails. And then I went on and lived lived my life when they didn't catch me. So that's it. So that's that's kind of it. So the, the problem with Walla is that, you know, it, it comes out that she was, she's a true crime fan. She's probably a big Peter fan. Probably been watching a lot of Lawyer You Know. Uh, she definitely was digging into Delphi uh, a lot, heavily. She had joined, she was a member of nine Facebook groups. I don't know if they found out like all Delphi related Facebook groups prior to like, so she was in these groups prior to treating them prior to treating them. So she joined our group defense diaries group on the day of the safekeeping hearing. So the day that she testified at that first safekeeping hearing in, in June 15th of 2022, she ran home and joined our, our Facebook group. And so she was really digging into the case. She went out to the bridge. She went out to the high bridge she accessed her database, which obviously the public does not have access to, to, to look up Kagan Klein's, all of his, his details about what he was arrested for when he got arrested. So she's compromised, in my estimation. Like if she has formed any kind of opinion as to innocence or guilt or whether or not he did it, any point during the time that she's treating him or prior to, and she's got to make a, like a gut call like on whether or not he's feigning. If, if she's landed on, I think he's guilty. She's going to say, I think he's feigning. Like even, even if it's subconsciously, because the fact of the matter is she just didn't, she didn't advise her supervisors that she was digging in like this into this case when he became her patient. You know, it's like that, that was obviously something that the defense was really digging into. And it was like, man, I mean, how can you trust her? Like, I, like all, everything else aside, you know, it's it, like if you put it all away and take that out of the mix, she becomes a much more credible witness in terms of what she's claiming Richard Allen was saying than, than having this, this circumstance wherein she's digging into the guy's case. You did, know, so did, then, go ahead. Did, did the defense expert comment on that? Oh, the yeah. Defense or comment on whether or not you should be looked because I, I heard that she was looking into the case. I didn't hear the detail like you just explained it, but yeah. did the defense expert comment about how inappropriate that is, how he would yeah. ever do that? Okay. Yeah. It, the jury got to hear that. Yeah, it's completely unethical. You know, okay. it's like, I mean, like, like basically everybody's opinion on Walla is she should no longer be licensed. You know, it's, it's like there's too much at stake for her to be doing that, like fangirling on this case and then like going and treating the guy to me is absurd, you know, but like, again, I'm looking at it from the perspective of a defense attorney. I always try to, it's like, I can't turn that off. Like, like that's how our brains work. Like when you become an attorney, 
my father and I'm sure your father told you the exact same thing. It's like I when I was young and, you know, my dad would tell me he's like he's like an attorney is who I am. Like fundamentally, it's become like who I am as a person. I'm like, oh, I think I was like 17, 16, 17. I'm like, I'll never let my job become who I am as a person. And then, you know, 10 years after becoming a lawyer, it becomes who you are as a person. You cannot separate yourself. You cannot change the way that you think. And, you know, I've always been a defense attorney, man. So that's like how my brain works. Everything goes through that filter. So when I, you know, I'm hearing it and I'm like, oh, and what, what led up to the confessions is that the defense was able to, to get them to play both of his interviews on October 13th and October 26th. So the way that this played out at trial is that you get, we got to watch both interrogations of Allen by three different cops. The first one is Tony Liggett, who at that point was not the sheriff, uh, but he, and then Steve Mullen, who was at that point, not a investigator for the prosecutors. He was the chief of police, I believe for Delphi. So they make the first run at Allen. So yeah. that's when they bring him in low key read technique him. You know, they're basically, they start off building the rapport, you know, kind of just asking some general questions. Cause at this point they only have the Hoosier harvest still of what they believe is his vehicle. So at this point in time on the 13th, they had, they had gotten the still, they had found out what Alan was driving. They went and took the pictures at CVS of his car. And then they come back to the Hoosier harvest store. They start looking in the video. They're like, there it is. We found it. So the first, the first run that they take at him, they're like, they're asking, so where, you know, where, which way did you park? Like, where did you park? What, what route did you take to get in? And he's like, I always, I always take the loop. Like it's coming in through the city, the town, it's the town route. Cause the other one, this 300 North is what they call the country route. And that's the one that he would have had to have driven by in order to be captured by that video. So they make the, you know, they, they go at him. It, it gets progressively harder. And, and in the middle of it, he's like, you know, I'm starting to get the feeling that, that you're, you're looking at me at, for this thing. And he's like, I, I'm not going to be anybody's fall guy. And he is like unflappable, like through this entire thing. Like there is no part of it where I think that this guy is, is like an expert liar and is just like able to be able to work through this hour interview without cracking ever at any point. I, I like I'm, I'm like, after I saw that, I walked out of the courtroom cause we had a break before we watched the second one. I'm like, man, I've seen plenty of interviews and, and this dude held up like a champ. I'm like, he's either, and, and this is a guy who's never been in the system. He, he's never been interrogated ever, you know? And, and when you're in that situation and we're talking about a double homicide and we're talking about them saying, we have you there at the time that the girls were killed. That was like, so that's what I'm saying. That was the low key read one, like where they're saying, we got you, you know, you, you might as well just tell us what's up. And he just held up like, like a champ during that, that entire interrogation. When you get into the second one, which is with Holman, who's now a Lieutenant, with the Indiana state police, it's just him and Allen. And they had already worked Kathy. They had already gone and told Kathy who was outside because they, they had gone there that day on the 26th. So this is the second interview under the guise that they were going to pick up their car. Now I'm sure you've told your, your viewers, if you're ever in that situation and law enforcement's telling you to come to the police station in order to pick something up that they've taken out of your custody in order to do some kind of testing Call your lawyer because they you're never leaving that police station if they're saying, yeah, come and get it. Like, so most people saw that Terraboon. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So he gets down there and, and same thing, same read technique. Holman's building rapport with him. He's like, oh yeah, you know, I was in the military too. You know, it's like, oh yeah, I like, I like guns. He's like, how often do you shoot your gun? You ever loan your gun out? And he starts giving Alan the ability to be able to, create a way out or a, a, a false narrative, which would explain how his bullet or his unspent casing was found at the crime seat six inches away from the girl's feet. And he doesn't bite on any of it. He's like, 
nah, I've never loaned my gun out. Nah, I've never loaned my car out. You know, no, I've never loaned my clothes out, you know, because he gave him every opportunity to kind of he's like, and he'll tell a little story. He's like, you know, my son, it's like if he's got his friends over, you know, his friends, you know, they'll they'll say, hey, man, you know, it's a little chilly out. I didn't bring a jacket. Could I borrow a jacket? Sure. And he takes a jacket and then he forgets it, you know, and then he'll have it for a couple of weeks. And then, he'll, you know, so he'll go through all that kind of stuff. Alan and it gets heated, It get, you know, at the end of it, like Alan knows because he's like, we got you. He's like, so, and so these are the big, the big lies that he tells him. And it was interesting on the stand because I don't know that most people that have never experienced a police interrogation or are not deep into true crime, have an understanding that the police per the Supreme court of the United States are allowed to lie to you in an interrogation in order to try to get you to make a statement against your own interest. I mean, they're, they're, they're allowed to do it. With, with within parameters, yeah. I there, mean, there they, are limits, but yeah, generally, right. So he comes in, and his his big lie is like, "All right, here's the deal. We we've got your casing, uh, and our expert has said that it matches your gun. It's it's there's no question about it. It's it's your bullet. It's your it's your round. There's done. Like it, like explain it to me. Tell, like how is your round there? He's like, I can't explain to you what's impossible. Like that's what he kept saying. Like he's like, I have no way to explain to you what's impossible. He's like, I, I didn't have my gun out there. I didn't drop around. He's like, have you ever gone out there like hunting mushroom hunting out there? Like, a, like you ever fished out there? He's like, no, he's like, I, I mean, like I, I never would have had a circumstance that my round would have fallen out of my gun there. It's like, you, like what you're telling me has to be bullshit because it can't be true. It can't be because I wasn't out there. So then he comes at him. He's like, well, He's like, the other problem that you have is that we had uh, a voice analyze. Uh, somebody came in and, and did uh, an expert did the voice analysis. And we know that that's your voice on, on Libby's video. We know it's you. It's like a complete match. He's like, you're, you're done. He's like, at this point, all I need you to do is try to make me understand it. Like, like what happened here? I mean, did like, you weren't planning on doing this and just, you know, that, that move that they're always like, help me understand. Help me help you. Just let me know what happened out there. And, you know, he just, he, he won't crack. It's like, and he goes at him really, really hard. You know, by the end of it, they're swearing at each other, screaming at each other. And then they bring Kathy in. All right. And have holding, you ever seen the four brothers? Oh yeah. When they, when they're like, oh, we got your hair, man. And they got him yeah. under the light and they're beating on him. And they're like, they're like your hair. Oh, I know why you have my hair. And they're like, cause I was with your mom last night or whatever. You know, it's like stuff like <laughs> right. that. Like, Funny, they're, but that's what they do. They're like, we got DNA. That's like, it, man. And that, that can be true. They can have DNA, but it doesn't mean the DNA they're trying to make it seem like they have, right. but they're saying they got DNA, you know, just because there's DNA. Exactly. There's DNA everywhere. And then that's how hard they ran at them. And then, yeah. you know, the last gasp was Kathy. So they had already, like I said, they had already worked Kathy out, out in the hallway. And mm -hmm. they said, you know, I, I don't even know how to tell you this, but you know, your, your husband's the one who did this. Like we found, we found his matching round to his gun six inches from Abby's feet. Like, I, I like, you know, I, we don't even know. So she goes in with the mindset that her husband had done this, you know, this like, and had lived with her for five years, like mind blown. Mm -hmm. And, and like, she has no reason to know that they're lying. She has no reason to know that they can lie about something like that. Mm -hmm. So she goes in and she's a puddle, you know, and he, and so he's trying to, he's trying to say, babe, you know me like the, He's like, I, like, she's like, well, how's, you know, she's asking for him to describe how the round got there. He's like, I, he's saying the same thing. He's like, how am I supposed to explain to you? I, I have no idea. It's impossible. It can't be my round, you know? So he survives both these things. And at the end of it, he's like, you know, he's like, F you. It's like, whatever, whatever your evidence is, he's like, arrest me. Like, let's, he's like, just do it. If you're going to do it, just do it. You know, he's like, cause like, whatever I'm saying isn't going to matter to you. You know, you, you've decided that, that I'm your patsy and that's it. So that's what, that, that's the date of arrest. And from that point forward, what I think happened, because again, and when I'm looking at a kind of totality of the circumstances, why is it like, we know what they had early. We know that they they had the round and they had him out at the bridge. They really don't have a time of death. 
like I kind of lost track there because in which I have a tendency to do, um, you know, when I was talking about the time of death, they couldn't establish it. They didn't do a core body temperature when they got to the girls and discovered them, you know, on the 14th. And, and we heard nothing about stomach contents. It blew my mind, dude. I'm like, cause we knew that the girls ate banana pancakes that morning and bananas are, are pretty sturdy like that. They don't digest very quickly. It's like mm -hmm. how that never came up by either side regarding the autopsy when they had dr core on the stand blew my mind man i'm like they did nothing to establish time of death in this case at all I, I, that's why i've been saying i'm attacking this timeline all day like that's where i'm at with this it's just attack the timeline forget the odin stuff forget it attack the timeline they can't they can't prove that that's when the girls died you know so other than just saying that that's when the phone stopped moving but that doesn't mean anything you know and then so going back to it, so you've got the, you know, the evidence that they have that he's out there at the bridge, they got the unspent casing, and then you got four individuals that that say that they see this this guy that they're now calling bridge guy. And that's it. That's their whole case. So once they make the run at him, and this is five years in, so they make the two runs at him on the 13th and the 26th, you know they are going and talking to one another and saying, I mean, I couldn't run at him any harder than we just did. I mean, he, this dude's not confessing to anything. And when you, and it's exactly what you just said. When you talked about trying that case without the confessions, it's laughable. So they, like they had to think, and at this point they had, they had searched the house. They had gotten the devices. I don't know. And it, and if I missed it at trial, I didn't hear it if they had extracted the devices that they had in that house prior to that interview on the 26, because if they knew at that point that there was no link to him, to, to the girls or to anything related to the actual crime that at that point, they're like, well, uh, we got to get a confession out of this dude. Like, I, I think that's literally how he ends up in Westville. You know, and it's it's just it's this coercive control where there it's just sensory deprivation for months on end. He's you know, and people are like, oh, he had his tablet. I'm like, they, like he would go weeks where he would have no communication with anyone other than seeing Walla for like 15 minutes or maybe an hour, and he's being held in a three by three cage, shackled, all, like. It was as close to like kind of a, you know, I've had people take exception to the fact where I've compared it to a prison of war type like circumstances, but it's accurate. You know, I mean, this guy was like, this it was just, just completely devolved his mind, he lost his mind, you know? So you're five months in when he starts with the, the confessions. And, and my thing is not that they were, because the defense had opined in their Frank's memo, or no, in their, it was either in the Frank's or their safe keep hearing or the safekeeping hearing motion that they filed where they said, well, look, I, I think with, you know, like we're, I think it was the Frank's memo because I want to be accurate about it. I, I think that he said, look, what we're guessing has happened here is that they've basically been threatening him. You know, we're going to kill your wife. We're going to kill your daughter. They obviously had no way to prove that. To me, what the more likely scenario is, is that after that type of deprivation from somebody who is in that mental state, who has that, that, that just that dependent disorder magnified by his major depressive disorder and his anxiety, which is really what turned, turned the psychosis into a thing like much faster than maybe normal. And like once they cracked them, I think the easiest way to get them to talk is say, look, man, do you want this to be over? I mean, you want to see Kathy? Like he had not seen his, he had not laid eyes on his wife in the seven months in the, in the five months prior, she had not been able to visit him. So they he had, they had cut him off from anything that you would consider to be support. And, you know, if you've never been in the system and you are ripped out of your life, and everything that, you know, um, it's it's hard for me to have discussions with people that kind of like can't fathom how that would affect somebody psychologically because it's it's devastating you know so he's a fragile egg 
That's what that's what Westcott called him. You know, I mean, when he came in, he was a fragile egg, and they just they cracked him. You know, so at, at that point, if if I'm the guard, you say you can end all this. Just say that you did it. Like they, it's that simple, and then we'll transfer you out of here. You'll get to see Kathy, and then that's what he does. You know, it's like he, that's he's. So I mean, to me. I don't think when we, if we get lucky enough to hear from the jurors, I don't think the confessions are going to be it if he gets convicted. I, I don't think really? that that's going to, I really don't, man. Wow. I know Lee thinks that they're powerful, especially the van thing, but I'm not, I'm not like in lockstep with her on that. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. This month is all about gratitude, and I'm so thankful for all of you who make this community great and uplift each other in the chat and in your lives. Sometimes it's hard to remind ourselves that we're trying our best to make the sense of everything in this crazy world, and it's not easy. But here is a reminder to send some thanks to people in your life that you appreciate, that you're thankful for, including yourselves, right? Because there's a lot of people that are thankful for you. And if you're thinking about starting therapy, and it'll help you, right, in how you deal with issues or problems with relationships and other things in your life, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge to make sure that if they're not helping you the way that you want to, you can find somebody who can and who will. So let's let the gratitude flow with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash lawyer today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash lawyer, L A W Y E R. So, my thought has been that the confessions are everything, and the yeah. jurors are going to flip on either they think they were coerced, and if they're coerced, he's for sure not guilty, or they're legit, and if they're legit, he's guilty. And yeah. a lot of the other stuff I think they're going to argue about, but <laughs> I've always felt like the con confession is going to be the turning point. So, you gave a, a really thorough investigation from beginning to end of, of the interrogation through the confession. And the interrogation was a big part for me too, but I've also heard people being like, well, that's what guilty people do. They deny the de deny deny. I was like, but we've all seen on YouTube, right? If you haven't had the, uh, the privilege of doing it and dealing with it in real life, we've seen people try to deny and, and it doesn't go well for them lots of times um, in cases. But so I, I thought his sounded different. And the way you just explained it again, does not sound like somebody's either a sociopath if he's that good at denying it and, and giving right. no um, cues that he actually did it. And we talked about how I was going to do this backwards, but since you've given the explanation, so that we, we talk about less than 1% are false confessions, less right. than 1% of cases have everything you just explained to them. Right. A, a strong denial, uh, a fragile egg being put in, and you, you said jail versus where he went to prison. You said county jail and People might not understand the people in county jail are people being held there that have a possession of marijuana or have some kind of small crime that they've been accused of all the way up to, you know, very serious crimes that people have been accused of and not convicted or people that have been convicted of misdemeanors, right? Driving with a suspended license or driving without a license or a habitual traffic offender, too many traffic tickets and you go to county jail for 30 days. Those are the people in county jail, very different type of people than are in the prison facility that he ends up at. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's unimaginable to understand what that's like for a person who has not been convicted of a crime yet. So again, I think his circumstances may fit the 1%, but my big pushback, which I can understand, I will say for me, I do think that my knowledge of the system and of cases and of clients is probably why I would end up in that not guilty bucket voting if I was on the jury, but I can understand how a jury can hear a guy say, I did it and believe it, right? They don't know him. They probably don't know. I don't know if it came out in trial that he's never been in the system before, never been arrested before. That usually doesn't come out. So I don't know if it came out in this trial, but <clears throat> so they don't know that. Um, from their perspective, he could be just as likely to have been in the system before or not been in the system because we've seen trials and had cases where, of course, they're repeat customers, like you said. So how do you deal with the fact that after everything you said, which again, a very, very thorough explanation of the issues with the confession, 60 plus confessions to people he knew, people he didn't know, mental health counselors, warden, people in the prison facility, his wife, his mom, saying things that are very normal, like, would you still love me if I did this, right? That's plausible for somebody to ask that question. And some of them seeming much more lucid than others. 
and some of the confessions happening after he has been testified as to be back to baseline, whatever that is, meaning no longer in psychosis. At least that's what I've heard the testimony was, that some of the confessions came even after that. How does that affect kind of how strong or firmly you stand where you stand on those confessions? Yeah, and until trial, like I was exactly where you're at right there because all those things are what matter. And so just I'm going to I'm going to kind of work my way backwards. So sure. on rebuttal, the state put on uh, the psychiatrist who was administering the Haldol shots is Dr. Martin. And it was it was it was stunning to me that the state put him on because he basically and they flew him in like overnight from Florida. Like, so he's down in your neck of the woods. They were like, do we need you up here? This dude came on and testified. And, and essentially it, it kind of ended on this note where he's saying that he had said that he was not in psych, he was not in a psychotic state on this. I believe that it was June 20th, which is when he right around the date when he makes the statement to his psychiatrist, where he said, I want to apologize to the family. So that, that kind of like ended, that's the the delineation, that's the demarcated line of the end of the confession, so that June 20th date. And he said, at that point, I, I did not see any kind of indications that he was psychotic at all. So what, what Rosie was allowed to do on cross-examination, Brad Rosie, one of the defense attorneys, is they showed, they queued up some of the camcorder video from that day from from about two hours later of Rick Rick Allen getting I think he was getting a shot but he's in with a, a either a nurse or a doctor somebody in scrubs they had aced all of the audio on that so we didn't get to hear the audio and this dude is catatonic like there he is sitting there like like the doctor or the nurse is talking to, there's no response. So at the, That's, so he's supposed to be back to baseline. He's supposed to be back to baseline at that point. And, and so Rosie's last question is, so he says, I know doctor that, that according to your records here, that you deem that he had no symptoms. He was showing no symptoms of psychosis at this point. He's like, now that you've seen, he's like, and did you, had you ever seen that video? of him on the same day that you saw him? He's like, no, I hadn't. Rosie got him to flip it. He's like, yeah, I've, I've changed my mind. He's like, I, I, he definitely was not out of psychosis. There was so, so uh, you wow. know, and, and like all this. I have not spoken, heard that at all. I have yeah, not Martin, that. Martin was a huge witness. And, and like, I could not believe that the state put him on as one of the rebuttal, their final rebuttal witness. Like that's, that was kind of the witness where it kind of turned for me because it's like, you know, but then again, am I, am, am I like suffering from confirmation bias? Because like, like, you know, with like Walla and all of her things that she did, you know, am, am I giving him too much grace with the, the long narrative form, really the most substantial confession that there is right out of, mm -hmm. out of everything he says, really the only one where there's any details is the one where he talks about the van like the van was the pivot in the middle of the trial where the state literally changed their theory of the case which baldwin the other defense attorney had warned the jury during openings i want you to pay attention this is what baldwin said during the middle of the trial the state is going to have to change their theory of the case right before your very eyes i want you to pay attention and the other thing i want you to do is to wait, wait until we get to put our evidence on and then make your decision. So, you know, as far as the confessions, man, like you said, at the end of the day, the volume of them may just be, may just be the thing that brings it home for the state. You know, it's like, you can't like, you can give, is it viable that they're all false? It is, it is. But at the end of the day, is it viable? that maybe some of them aren't or that maybe they are true. You know, it's like, that's, and how is the jury big, supposed to know? Right. That's the big thing for me not being there. Right. Which is why my vote on this case matters even less than it does on any other case. Cause I wasn't there to actually hear them and see how they were portrayed yeah. and how the jury took them. Because to me, all it would take is all the crap that, cause here's the other thing that's very 
possible, right? That we hate to hear or think about, and this is America and it shouldn't be like this, but the crappy police work to what they didn't test, to what they didn't gather, to who they didn't talk to, to how they had compromised people involved, to where they put him in that horrible prison system into horrible conditions, to where they interrogated him unfairly and they trampled all over his rights and to how the judges handled this process, that doesn't mean he didn't do it, right? right. And in, a, in most cases, I would be like, I don't care. That's such a horrible investigation. They dropped the ball so much that you cannot let them convict on something like that. The exception is unless they confess and said they did it. If they right. confess and say they did it, then they did it. And let them right. let them do the time for the crime that they're confessing and admitting to commit it, to to committing. So that's that's the big gripe here is that's what makes this case so difficult. And that's to me. And again, I'm not on the jury. That would be it. I would have to throw the rest away because if the confession's not legit, it's it's not guilty. It, it has right. to be not guilty. Right. It was such a horrible put horribly put together case. Way too long. They didn't have anything. They pushed. They pressed. They had to try to get what they thought was justice for these victims and these victims absolutely deserve justice. They deserve 100%. justice. And that's, what's going to suck here is, is I kind of felt because of the judge, because of law enforcement, because of the prosecution and because of all of the crap that's all over these confessions, I'm not going to feel confident regardless of what this verdict is. I know, man, I'm, I'm in that's the exact, really it really does. It, 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 and it's devastating. And, and like either way, it's like, if he's convicted, like I, I, I'm, I'm always gonna wonder. I'm always gonna be like, I, like right. And if, and if he's, if he's acquitted, like, I'm always gonna wonder because mm -hmm. the investigation was so bad because of all the things that they did. Everything that you just said will always have me wondering because they just didn't do it on the up and up. Now there's no going back in time and you know redoing the investigation. And then the other part of it is if he's acquitted. Is the state going to dig in that the jury got it wrong or are those two families going to sit there without ever having this thing get solved because they've decided to dig in and we're not going to investigate it anymore? You know, I mean, like that, like, like the concept of everything either way is a nightmare, really, you know, and, it, and it's like if you could just strip away the confessions, which you can't because they exist. You, you know, and it, and it's like this thing where, you know, I, I and you know I, how hard it is for them to investigate somebody else. Cause now if I'm defending the other guy, you're like, that saying. guy said he did it. Right. That guy 60 times said he did it. Right. That's you know, and, evidence. and you know, obviously in this case, there was that entire, the, you know, the theory with the, the five. So yeah, I have guys. two more questions for you and that's one of them. So let me, yeah. let me pose the question for you. Cause, cause just a couple minutes on the Odinism and the third party defense. How important do you think it would have been? Do you think it was trying to point at the boogeyman? Was it too outlandish? Was it too big of a conspiracy kind of thing? Tell me what your thoughts are on that. And then my last question is going to be, I want to end on what, because you're sitting in there looking at the jurors. Yeah. What is your vibe from the jurors? Who did they listen to, take notes from, make facial expressions from? You know, who were they looking at where since you're sitting right next to Kathy, were they looking at her at certain points? So kind of your vibe there. But I do want to hear about what you think about the Odinism and the, the third party culprit stuff. Well, I, I think it would have depended on how they used it. Like okay. if they would have gone full, you know, full ritualistic murder thing, it, it would have reminded me of Karen Reed. It's like because I, I was very much of the mindset that when they got those two gifts from God known as those, you know, the, the two doctors who were the, the accident, the accident reconstruction yeah, guys, yeah. Wolf and Rensselaer. Yeah. I'm like, man, we don't, we don't get witnesses like that where they're not a hired gun. They have no horse in the race. You don't get those guys. Like if I'm Karen Reeds, if I'm, if I'm Jackson and Unetti, I'm, I'm, I'm ditching the whole conspiracy thing, even though that might've been what happened. I, like if I'm trying to win the case for my client, I'm going with these two witnesses who are so credible they have so much like just at their cvs are impeccable and 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 they're not hired by the defense and they're coming in and they're saying exactly what you need them to say to get you reasonable doubt because once you go into this theory that in that case and in this case is going to be impossible to sell to 12 people there is there is no way on on god's green earth that you're ever selling either of those two theories to 12 different individuals. They're just, they're too, they're too much for people to handle. 
it's difficult to prove anything to 12 people. And when right. you have a theory like that, you've now taken on the burden to prove something as the defense, right. which is not usually in the wheelhouse. It's in, in, in man. So if it would have been that they would have just kind of said, all right, look, the, the crime scene was very unusual. If they could have gotten more, forget about the Odin stuff. Like I, like I would have tabled it. Like if, if, if I was really working with the defense, I would have said, Hey, table the whole Odin thing. Like, I, I get it. Like, I know that there's a link. I, I think that, you know, that that could be the way that you could connect these five guys, that that was kind of their underlying thing. But let's, let's forget about like, just making that like the basis of the defense. Right. But, but just say, look, you know, these guys knew each other through this. This is a common thing that they had. The crime scene was very, very unusual. And we have this one guy who has made a statement to law enforcement that if my if I spit on one of the girls, but I had a reason for doing it, am I good? Like, like, you know, focus on the things that were powerful, which to me did create a nexus. I don't know how that confession, whether it's a hypothetical or not, because it wasn't really a hypothetical. If I spit on the girls, it's like, if you find my spit on the, on one of the girls, but I have a, a, an explanation for, you know what I mean? I'm focusing on that end of it. It, it would have been huge. Like Allison, my, my wife and my partner was always huge on, on needing a third party culprit to point the finger at for a jury that they need that person, especially in a homicide. So it would have been big, you know, I mean, depending, depending on how they played it, it, just even to say it's just as likely with with the, with the almost nothing burger they have on Richard Allen, it's just as likely it's this guy or just as likely it's that guy. And if it's just as likely three people, there's no way they prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it's Richard Allen. That's that's a very common defense that works. Like right. if they have no motive and there are holes in the evidence that they've got to try to fill with certain stuff and you give them somebody else that's just as likely uh, right. the person, then, then that's reasonable doubt and that can be enough to win a case, right? Without proving that the sticks were a certain way and it's Odinism right. and that's why one was trustful. Now, it is a why, right? And jurors like a good why. So Odinism potentially is a why and it never really sounds like besides he decided he wanted to assault these girls that day. That's the only why really that we have in this case. Right. But I, I do think that's the only thing it would have gone, but it's very, it, it to toes the line of pointing at the boogeyman and you got to be careful pointing at the boogeyman versus, you know, John Smith who right. says he spit on the girl or whatever. Right. Um, okay. Lastly, what, what's the vibes from the jury? What, what are you thinking when you're looking at the jury? What are you picking up um, where they're looking, how they're reacting notes, they're taking questions. They're asking, what are you thinking? Right they were super attentive. I mean, they're, they're kind of like that jury. And, and the other thing that I like about the jury questions is it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, I don't want to be overly broad with it, but like intelligence level. I mean, they, they appear to be, to be a very bright jury. Their questions were very thoughtful. Uh, they, they really didn't miss a beat. I mean, many of the questions asked were, questions that I was wanting asked when I'm sitting out in the gallery, you know, mm -hmm. as an attorney and you're sitting there and you're watching like, and this is the first trial I've ever observed from front to back ever where I'm not in the well of the courtroom. So it was driving me nuts. Like Allie was with me one day and I'm like, you have to like, and I know how she is. I'm like, I'm like, you cannot be making audible noises. Like gull is just waiting to throw me out of that courtroom. Like you <laughs> cannot, you have to control yourself because she'll be like, Oh my God, you know, so I'm like, all right, they were hyper attentive, man. They took notes at the times that you'd want them to take notes. They were, they were attentive at the times that you want them to be attentive in terms of, you know, cause like when you have jurors taking notes, you don't want them writing the whole time. You want them making notes on things that they think are significant and then observing the witnesses with their eyeballs in order to try to help them judge credibility. So like, as far as that goes, I never saw anybody nodding off. I, I saw all of them like diligently taking notes. I saw them leaning forward quite a bit. They were very engaged, you know, from beginning till end, man. I, I never got the sense that, you know, and, and to the credit of both sides that tried the case that, you know, we didn't get any of those days where we had an expert on the stand for seven hours where, your eyes are rolling back and then, yeah. you know, into your skull. It's like they, they were pretty efficient with getting experts on and off the stand. So you didn't have, it was kind of like a lot, you know, I'd say most days we averaged six, six, seven witnesses, you know, some days, maybe eight, 
they were kind of quick hits, you know, because when you break the day up, you get your your late morning break. You start at nine, you know, nine fifteen, whatever. You get your first break at eleven. You know, you go for forty five minutes, and then you take your lunch, and then you're back. And it would go like that. There, you'd have like kind of your longest stretch of the day. So, um, man, I, I just I feel like they got a good jury. But you know as well as I do that like that and a nickel will get you nothing. You yeah. Know? Like but it, I think it's good at least where we can sit here and say, and this is a case really, not all case. Some cases I'm like, I don't know how a jury got there, but this case I feel like I'm going to understand where the jury lands regardless of what comes back. And that's not always the yeah. case, right? But I think I'm going to understand if they come back with a guilty verdict. I think I'm going to understand if they come back with a not guilty verdict. I think there's right. there's multiple ways to look at this case and – that's scary as a defense attorney, right? Especially if you're sitting there and you think your guy's innocent. I mean, I you you mentioned that earlier, like it's the hardest thing in the world to sit next to somebody that could be getting the death penalty. And I had a lawyer at a conference tell me one time, he came up to me, he was actually speaking and I went up and talked to him afterwards. He's, you know, all these hundred million dollar verdicts. One of those guys, it was a, it was a plaintiff's personal injury conference. And he's like, I could never stand next to it. He's like, I don't know how criminal defense attorneys do it. Like, he's like, I'd sweat through my shirt. If I was sitting there where my guy's going to leave his wife and young child to go to prison for the rest of his life for 10 yeah. years, whatever it may be. And it's, it's a different vibe, a different feeling, especially I'm sure that's what these guys are feeling based on the Frank's motion and what I think they actually believe in the way that they write and seem to argue. It seems like they believe it. Does it mean they believe it? Not necessarily, but it seems like it to me, which is the toughest chair to sit in when you think you're sitting next to an innocent man. That's 100%. the toughest chair to sit in. It really is. And, and I like, and it's not just this set. It's like the, the set that was temporarily placed in their stead when they were removed from the case said the same thing, man. It's like, like you have four lawyers and like, I, like what I was saying about this case from the get, when you get a hundred and whatever it was, 39 page Frank's motion, it's like that, like, that's a lawyer who actually thinks that I'm like, this is what it looks like when a lawyer believes that their client's factually innocent. You know, and it's not to say that, you know what I mean? They violated not, his Fifth Amendment right. They violated right, his right, your Fifth typical, right. right, your boilerplate motions, yeah. you just getting all your, your stuff filed. Like this, this wasn't that, man. You know, it's like I just got that, that vibe from them that I'm like, man, like these dudes like legit think this guy is factually innocent. So, but like you said, man, um, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the amazing and terrifying thing about our system, man. It's like, you, you know, it, it's flawed as flawed as it is. It's still the best that there is in the world. Yeah. And, you know, and it's a heavy weight and, and, and I'm seeing what I want to see. I, I would have been incredible. And, and, you know, we both cover trials all the time on our channels and it's, you know, you'll get those cases where like, they're going to come back in two hours. Like the whole Tellas thing. I'm like, that thing was like, that is the worst of And that thing went days. I'm like, what? I'm like, what is happening here? You know, so it's like you just you never know what a jury is going to do, but you want them to deliberate. You want them to especially either way. They're they're coming in and devastating somebody or a bunch of people on either side, you know, and they're acutely aware of that. And, you know, you want them to to really go in there and, and be thoughtful about it and thorough and do do the work, you know, go through, you know, the kind of rule of thumb get an hour of deliberation for every day of trial. And they had 17 days. I think there is. It doesn't at, always hit, but yeah. It does not it, always it, hit. It, tell it, us the rule of thumb is. That doesn't does always hit. Always I'll just say. I just, my case, I usually just am very excited when they ask for a calculator. Uh, that, that's the, that's the <laughs> yeah. part of mine. Um, but so, so first off, I'm really glad we did this because I do think long form content um, is, is good to get into the nuance. Cause usually if, if anybody just follows your Twitter, they may not have thought you would have these nuanced thoughts or openings for discussion or gray areas and understanding there are different ways to look at it. I knew you would. Um, yeah. cause again, I've listened to some stuff too, but I'm glad it's out there because I do think that's important, um, that you're not going to hate this jury. If they come back guilty, you're going to understand, oh. especially with the expert stuff. Like if they believe the expert, that's why they're the expert. That's why they get paid. I am also not one to usually say, oh, it's going to be hung jury. Half the 50% of cases people think are going to be hung juries because it seems so hard to think six or 12 people are going to all agree on a unanimous verdict. But this is one where I do think it may be difficult to pull a juror to the other side if they're adamant and dug in on what they think about the confessions. Like 100%. if it's not guilty and you're sitting back there alone and you think this guy confessed to it, you might never switch. 
or right. vice versa. If you think this was coerced out of this guy and he was abused to confess, you may never want to send an innocent man to prison for the rest of his life. So you might just stick on that one. So while I never would vote or guess that it's going to be a hung jury, I can understand how we got there in this case too, which just opens up even more uncertainty. Guilty, not guilty, hung jury. Who the heck knows in this one? I know. And and I'm with you. Like, I, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning hung. Like, I, I really, because I, of exactly what you just said. You know, because you want, we always look for jurors that are going to be able to to hold their ground. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like you, that you beg them to do that. You're asking that during voir dire. You're like, look, when they come at you, are you going to be able to hold your ground? Are you going to be able to maintain your position, you know, in, in the face of adamant argument against your position? Can you, can you stick to your guns, you know? And it's, in this case is that man, it's just, it's like, it's such a weird case because of just the just the lack of real evidence, but then you bring in the confessions and it's such an X factor and like you hear them and they're not all that compelling, but they're kind of compelling. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause he, well, I mean, he's he still wrote sitting them, there he saying he did them. it. Somebody else wrote them. I mean, it, there's a lot there, man. There's no, a lot there. And so I think much. that's, yeah, that's, that's really what it comes down to. And if you think about it, the jury's already been able to discuss this case, so they had potentially yeah. weeks to talk about it. They're sequestered. They want to get back to their life, their home, their family. There's a holiday on Monday, and they're still not pushing a verdict. I mean, that says something. They're stuck. Like, they're, they're stuck. stuck, and that's usually what leads to a hung jury, not saying that yeah. it's guaranteed, but I'd want to get home, right? And I'm a lawyer, and I do this. I'd want to get home. I could understand why they would want to get home, yeah. and they're not. So that's it's a big deal. It's a big deal, especially on Friday, you know, because I mean, that, that was like the kind of the prevailing thought. thought. Let's call it, let's get it done. Let's go home. It's been a month. You know, we've gotten four, whatever, three or four Sundays with our families. Because remember, they're like not only sequestered, they're like Luddite sequestered. No, no devices. Like they are shut down from the world, which out of all the things that, that Gull has done in this trial, that's one that I'm actually very grateful that she she did do especially just in light of everything that's gone on with like i know you were deep into to maya's case and like just we see it over and over and over where either witnesses or jurors are digging into these cases mm -hmm. on socials or on youtube whatever the case may be and it's a problem you know so it's like it, from that that extent from that perspective i was i was grateful that she was very draconian in terms of this thing i'm like I don't know if there's like selected DVDs that they have, that they have them. Like, I don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And it's like, but she locked it down. So, and, and, you know, the other thing kind of like maybe to wrap it, um, the, the one thing I'm, I'm in retrospect, if they come back with an acquittal on this, I'm actually going to be thrilled that they didn't get the Odinus stuff in the third party stuff in because like it'll validate what I've been saying about this case in terms of the weakness of it from the get, you know what I mean? Cause that's always been my position on it. It wasn't that I, I thought that he was innocent or guilty. I just thought that that the, the amount of evidence they had was not enough to mm -hmm. convict somebody in this country for that type of crimes, you know, and that was always my thing. And, and now since they didn't get to bring any of those defenses in, and if they come back with an acquittal, it kind of proves my point you know, which from a selfish perspective, you know, I mean like completely, but like, it, it's just kind of, you know, it, it's one of those cases, man, that I think unfortunately may haunt people for a long time, you know? Yeah. That's what sucks. That's what sucks. Yeah. But we'll see, right. We'll see if we have a verdict that yep. goes past next week. I'll be shocked. So boots on the ground, Bob Mata, defense diaries. We're going to link everything in the description. If you want to check yeah, out make sure you get my YouTube channel. I'm a little baby YouTube channel. Absolutely. I got, uh, we just broke Absolutely. 30. I'm 30K. excited. 32, 32. So I'm excited. Go yeah. subscribe, hit the like button on all of his videos, everybody watching this. Um, but yeah, we'll put all of that. All that'll be in the, in the description. Um, thanks for popping on, man. We'll, we'll get you You're back awesome. after to talk post verdict on what we think this means and where it goes from there. But till next time we're out of here. You're awesome, dude. Appreciate you so much. Thanks. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. 
If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyerunow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know.